thank you everybody who uh, are currently joining and continue to join this uh, webinar, which is part of a series. My name is Roger Tatoud. I am Deputy Director at the International Aid Society in charge of the Global HIV Vaccine Enterprise. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, first panel discussion of a series on the design approaches for current and future HIV prevention efficacy trial. Uh, this event follow up, uh, follows up in the steps of the previous event that was held in 2018. Thank you, Roger. And it's a real pleasure to join you all again. Um, this is a uh, wonderful uh, adventure, I think, uh, in this new vir virtual era. Um, again, apologies, we're not seeing you in person, but delighted that you've joined us anyway, and we hope that over this series, uh, we will have a, an important time of dialogue and learning from each other, as well as, you know, finding new ways of, of solving uh, the problems, uh, the challenges that face us as we continue to find prevention options. And I must say, I think we, we think, uh, whilst we're thinking very seriously about HIV, I think it's important to note that this will have application to other areas of infectious disease um, research and other areas in, uh, of, of clinical research more broadly. So I think uh, this is an important time when we hope people will also bring insights from other fields of medicine. So uh, great pleasure, as, as Roger said, I'm Linda Gell Becker. I'm the director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and we have, I hope, uh, already listened to six fantastic talks. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six excellent talks. I'm going to introduce the panelists who, who gave those talks, um, and they'll be joining us this afternoon uh, together with uh, the three terrific people who helped us put this, um, this uh, whole series together. Uh, Deborah Donnell was part of that, Holly James, of course, and Veronica Miller, together with Roger, um, and a little bit of help from myself, but actually those uh, individuals were very important in, in devising uh, this terrific um, series of, of uh, discussions. But this afternoon, uh, we will be recounting the six talks. If you'll recall, uh, we started the series of talks with Susan Buchbinder, who actually isn't joining us uh, this afternoon, but will be uh, very ably substituted by Jorge Sanchez, who is also very involved in the Mosaico trial. And uh, just to remind you all that Susan gave us a terrific uh, rationale for the Mosaico trial. Um, this is the j, &J uh, ad 26 HIV vaccine trial currently underway around the world. Um, and in that important foundational talk, Susan reminded us that there are a number of different ways as she, she described um, the, the, the notion of layering, which is of course the methodology that um, Mosaico is actually using. There is also the comparing, and we'll talk about that in a moment that uh, Rafi uh, described and then the combination type of approach uh, to how we can design prevention clinical trials. Mosaico came in uh, to its discussions about designs as we were contemplating oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And clearly the, the design team, the protocol team had to do a lot of discussion, both within their setup, but also with many stakeholders around the world. And here we want to thank Stefan Wallace, uh, who heads up this very important work uh, within the HIV vaccine trials network. And he gave us really a, a terrific talk about just how comprehensive that stakeholder engagement was uh, on Mosaico. And indeed that work goes on um, in other clinical trials as the HIV vaccine trials network does its work. Um, and so delighted to have Stefan Wallace on uh, this afternoon also uh, to discuss some aspects of uh, that community engagement and other uh, stakeholder engagement. We then heard about HPTN 083 from Rafi Landowitz and many of you who are in the field will know that this is the year that we heard about 
the outcomes of HPT and 083. Um, and again, thank Rafi for taking us through the rationale of that design uh, and where we kind of landed, as it were, um, the pros and cons, the rights and wrongs, uh, as Rafi described. And thank you, Rafi, for joining us this afternoon again to describe that. Deborah then used HPT and 083 together with another trial that is also going to read out soon. Um, no spoiler alerts, but just to let you know that we will be hearing the AMP trial results soon. So 2020, as, uh, as infamous as it has been, it's also been wonderfully famous uh, because we've heard some terrific uh, prevention results coming forth. And we will be hearing the AMP results before the end of the year. Uh, but Deborah, in her expert way, um, described how counterfactual um, assessment can be used in clinical trial design and compared what we might have learned from AMP and how that could have been utilized uh, together with the 083 data, really uh, illustrating the value of the counterfactual. I want to thank Eugene Rosaguera, who uh, introduced those of you who didn't know about PrepVac, a wonderful MAMS design, as he described it. Um, multi-step and multi-phase um, to that, uh, uh, that trial design, combination of vaccines as well as pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I think the way of the future as our designs get more and more complicated, uh, maybe also just showing the wonderful simplicity of the thinking and, and the wealth and depth of that clinical trial. So thank you, Eugene, and he's with us this afternoon. And then finally, Dave uh, Glidden, uh, an expert in this, um, Dave gave a superb talk reflecting on prep back and its richness, but then really drilling down on, on the concept of the run-in or the registration cohort, um, and then introducing recency as a very valuable way of also kind of doing a concertinaed registration um, as, as sort of approach, as it were, um, with recency. So that is my way of just reminding you all of what we've learned in the last a um, uh, little while of, of watching these wonderful videos. Thanks again to everyone for putting them together. And so now it's my pleasure to launch our discussion. We have uh, about 50 minutes. Uh, we want to encourage people to um, put their questions into the question and answer box. Um, and I will field them there and uh, share them out amongst the, this wonderful array of experts. But to start off, um, Maybe Stefan, I'll, I'll start perhaps where it should always start. And that is with the, the participants themselves, the volunteers who take part in our clinical trials. Clearly, as we contemplate more complexity in the clinical trials, more difficulty in understanding how the standard of care is being uh, applied within the clinical trial design, that's gonna need more discussion. And I wonder if you could just, um, you know, unpack again for us a little bit, um, you know, the, the, the extent of that engagement, the importance of it, and also just um, maybe some of the lessons out of the Mosaico journey. Uh, what, what do you really want to bring home um, in terms of the, the ethical engagement? Thank you for that, uh, Linda Gill. I um, am glad to be here um, amongst everyone, my esteemed panelists. And um, I also took part in helping to organize this event. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that as well. Um, community engagement is extremely important to all of us. Um, it really involving communities and the design and implementation and dissemination aspects of trials uh, is really a, a part of the HPTN and HPTN process. And this involves ensuring that communities also provide an ethical lens and frame uh, to these conversations. Uh, and this also took place in the mosaical study, as I mentioned uh, throughout my presentation, and that we must also remember to center community voices and that communities should be engaged as partners in this process, acknowledging their assets and strengths um, and not just viewed as end users of products. Couldn't agree more. 
Um, I wonder if anyone else, maybe Jorge, from your point of view, staying with Mosaico, what was the feedback um, from, you know, from participants in terms of grappling with, with the trial design of Mosaico? Um, you know, did, did, I know it was an exemplary effort to, to engage, but was there still a feeling that there were some gaps, some confusion, um, some difficulties around trans, you know, really communicating the trial design? Uh, well, in Peru, we have started by, uh, before uh, start the study, we posed the trial design to the community advisory board. And we then, uh, with the help of them, we organized a series of um, uh, educational materials that uh, is uh, shared by the social networks. Uh, we didn't get any feedback saying that they don't understand. What happened in Peru is that we have not participated in a vaccine trial for at least 10 years. So there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of um, willingness to participate. So we are uh, recruiting very fast. I remember that the quarantine has made that to go to postpone or in some cases stop enrollments. Uh, Peru started at the end of August and we are already over 2,030 participants enrolled in only two months. So I think this is uh, taken by the community in, with a lot of enthusiasm. Great, and I just want to remind everyone uh, again that this was the layering that um, that Susan described that was in, engaged in, in Mosaic. Uh, maybe let, let me come back to you again, Jorge, or anybody else on the panel who wants to answer that. Is there a point at which, you know, I imagine as PrEP is taken up, you know, even oral PrEP, as it becomes more popular, is there going to be a point where the sort of layering design just becomes impossible to do um, or is no longer valid as, as an option. Um, it, you know, in other words, have we got a limited time where the layering approach is going to be valid? And, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Jorge to answer first, but maybe anybody else who wants to weigh in on that. Sure. As um, Susan uh, mentioned in her talk, uh, we are trying to fill the mosaic with a new tale. And uh, so as far as we continue to find new possibilities of prevention tools, uh, we will need to have more complexity in our designs. Uh, by now, uh, I can ensure that the proportion of people who are willing to take PEP is increasing. And uh, therefore, if we are going to do the same design in five years, probably the proportion of people will be very high. I can ensure, for example, that AMP has around 5% of people willing to take PrEP, while for Mosaico so far, there is, only, there is 15%. So it has been in only a year and a half and double the expectation from the community to start PrEP. So I think it's going to be more and more difficult to find people who do not want uh, to use PrEP or with a new modality, which uh, uh, is cabotegravir, I think more, it will be even more difficult. Remember that adherence is particularly important for oral PrEP. So uh, from, cabot from the cabotegravir study, we found that people probably do, are not adherent to the oral PrEP, but having the injectable version of, of PrEP will um, actually uh, increased adherence in, in, uh, in terms of um, PrEP because uh, uh, there are no pills in the middle. So I think it will be more and more difficult in the future. And we need for this future, this new designs, right? Yeah, correct. I mean, if, you know, I'll, I'll, you know maybe Rafe, you want to comment in here, if, if, you know, the notion of more than one PrEP modality starts to take into consideration better adherence because we're now developing products for everybody. 
presumably layering is going to become more and more difficult. What, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, perhaps while we're waiting. Oh, Deborah. Then, um, yeah. I, I think the way, the way I think about it is that Mosaico is um, possible at the moment because we are aware that there are people who, for whom oral prep is something they're not interested in. And I think what we don't yet know is if we, when something like Cabotegravir is licensed and as it becomes more and more available, we don't know, yet know, um, using Susan's language, like how big the tile for prevention will be. So you, you could see that, um, and, and we just don't know this, but if it's possible that in the future, the Cabotegravir tile will cover a lot of people. And if you were trying to do the mosaic strategy, there's not very many people left for, to enroll who are not willing to use any of the existing modalities. And that I think is what we are anticipating might create a, um, a place where that gap doesn't exist and we have to come up with different ways of testing um, new drugs. Great, yeah. And, and, and I must say, I think that Mosaico uh, sort of concept is, is wonderful for creating the, the illustration. I just want to echo what Deborah said that, you know, one of the I things that likely contributed to the, the dramatic result in HPTN 083 was we selectively sought participants who would, were likely to be challenged by daily oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And that's the advantage of the long acting, of course, is it it provides better coverage of sex acts um, because it doesn't have that obligation of adherence to a pill based regimen. So um, I think the real strength of cabotegravir is not only another effective prep agent, but bringing people who might not feel self efficacy of using a pill based prevention method um, because of concerns about stigma of being seen with it or adherence to it or cost or or um, pill-based side effects um, to the prevention conversation. And so um, bringing more individuals to the PrEP conversation is gonna make the layering harder. And of course, the expanding toolbox with the Depivirin ring um, you know, uh, for, for women, of course, cisgender women, um, is, is just going to give more options, but also make that strategy more challenging. So I, I'm gonna May just return, oh, sorry, Dave. Definitely. Sorry, I just want to weigh in. I, I would say 083, as described, is an example of a non-layering approach. It is actually selecting people who um, do not want, who were unlikely to be pill takers. It may be possible in the future that even though the delivery system of a vaccine and an injectable may be similar, that people may feel strongly about having something that's immune-based. A, a, a lot of people like the idea of simulating their immune system as opposed to an, an antiretroviral. So it may not just be the delivery mechanism, but also the product and there may exist a substantial demand for something that it's injectable, but not an antiretroviral. And, and that doesn't have to be repeatedly injected, it, uh, maybe just a prime boost. Yeah. And um, we, we'll perhaps come back to that I in a moment. But I, before we sort of move away from Mosaico, I just want to come back to Stefan. There's a, there's a good question here from Jeremy around, again, community engagement. Jer Jeremy Sugarman, thanks for joining us this afternoon. So uh, Jeremy asks, you know, what if, if any changes were made to the trial design of Mosaico? as a result of that community engagement. Uh, so, you know, putting our, our money where our mouths are, where as it were, in terms of this community engagement, did we actually incorporate any thoughts or ideas from the community into the trial design uh, as, as part of that process? Thank you for that. Um, and I would say yes. I think the two main uh, changes to the design was the inclusion of transgender men in the study as well as the confirmation of the layered approach. Um, this layered approach that, that Susan talked about, we were really talking about this as an idea, as a concept, and through our community and stakeholder engagement processes, as well as with ethicists and, and other groups, we were able to confirm that this was the best approach to take. Thanks, thanks for that. So here's, here's something that I think gets a little bit at this, uh, this difficulty of where we're, you know, 
obviously our best trial design is where you take a group of people and they're randomly, you know, divided into one group or another. So uh, Yegor Veronin asks, are there any common characteristics of people who chose to refuse PrEP? So what is it about those people? And are there lessons learned for identifying and enrolling such people in prevention trial? Um, Jorge, I wonder if you want to jump onto that. But again, um, Rafi, you might have some insights given that you you have said that to a certain extent, you did select for a particular kind of, of individual. Okay. Yes, uh, Linda. Um, for the Mosaico study, we have around 10% of people who were pre-screened that are willing, to, that were willing to um, take prey. Uh, we do not have an analysis yet of, about the characteristics of this uh, par potential participants because they actually did not arrive to the clinic. Among people who arrived to the clinic, the proportion of people who actually wanted to, um, uh, uh, to take PrEP and actually we did not decide to enroll them because we sent them according to our PrEP plan to uh, take the PrEP for free. So in the different sites in the world, we have different sources of uh, drugs for PrEP. For instance, some countries are, drugs are paid by HGTN uh, for the network, from the network. Uh, in Peru, for instance, we have a commitment from Gilead since several years ago, we have five more years to go of uh, supplies from Gilead. And in other countries, uh, like, uh, in Europe mainly, the government will take, is taking care of the PrEP. So basically, we, um, to the question, we do not have the analysis of the characteristics yet. And uh, I think having the supplies of uh, medications uh, allow people to be more comfortable to say, I want to go to the PrEP and they will get it. So, and that is very good for the community. Any further thoughts from you, Rafi? Yeah, thanks, Linda Gale. Um, I do want to just uh, clarify one point that I made before in that the, the, um, the inclusion exclusion criteria for 083 actually did not obligate a history of non adherence to oral prep or even a perceived challenge. That was just the way we sort of conceived it when speaking of it. Because honestly, daily oral prep or even on-demand prep for MSM um, works so well that really it's hard to um, justify saying take a chance on an experimental product if you have a product that's working very well for you. It's more that if you think that there would be a preference for an injectable product or you think it might be challenging to maintain this um, this level of adherence or a prescribed pattern or anticipating sexual activity that might allow the use of a highly effective product that would make one want to engage in research about a more long acting product. So um, the OA3 population is by definition a mix of those populations. And you know we did um, uh, tenofovir plasma concentrations on uh, uh, a random uh, subset of the 083 participants who had been randomized to TDF FTC and found that 86% of them had detectable tenofovir in plasma, which was more than the study design had been predicated upon. The original study design and power calculation had been done with a predicated tenofovir, uh, TDF FTC. Um, uh, uh, detectable plasma tenofovir concentration level of adherence of 57.5%. So um, actually, we got a population that overall um, was actually more adherent than we anticipated. So I think it, it speaks to some additional analyses that really need to be done about the study population to understand what the motivations were for participating um, if challenge to oral pill taking may not have been the major driver. And that sort of raises, I think, in people's heads, and maybe Deborah, or David, or anyone would like to sort of tackle the, the question of, how, so how do we really get a handle on how many people are using PrEP, you know, in any one of these sort of 
designs as 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 put forward, uh, or perhaps particularly the layered and the combined concepts that <clears throat> Susan described. How how do we get a handle on how much prep is being used in in, in either in the background? or in the sort of underneath, as it were, if you think of the layered approach. Um, either of you have any thoughts or just want to expand on that a bit? I'll take a stab at it. I have to say, um, it, when we use the, um, the compare approach in HBT 083, um, one of the biggest unknowns was how well people were going to take PrEP. And um, I think as Susan and Illustrated and Jorge has talked about is the willingness of people to take PrEP, the interest in PrEP, the actual use of PrEP is changing dynamically. And so when you're designing a study, this is a true challenge. You, 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 you basically take an educated guess and you, um, you measure. So, so I think we did all of the trials are measuring the uptake of PrEP. And I can tell you in the AMP trials and in 083, um, which are the uh, data we know something about, um, the, the levels are very incredibly variable across the sites. So this is a real challenge for um, designing a trial because we know that if a substantial fraction of people are on PrEP, it is going to decrease the incidence rate. We have seen incidence rates even in the new product trials that are you know, close to 1%, Discover was even about a half a percent. And this is getting into territory where um, fully achieving full power for a, for a randomized comparison is marginal. I mean, I, I would comment to you that our current vaccine and prevention trials are topping out at about 5,000 participants. I don't, um, I don't think many people think that we can double that number um, given HIV epidemiology and our need to recruit from populations at risks with people with risk characteristics. I think this is not a generalized epidemic like COVID I don't think 30,000 participant trials are mm. really considered to be feasible in HIV. And I, this is in a certain sense is one of the things that motivates this discussion about what other ways can we get evidence. Um, and I think PrEP, essentially that this increasing level of use of PrEP and more effective PrEP availability is um, arriving at a place where it's, you know, if, they, if the incidence rates are driving down below 1%, I, I think we are going to need to look for other strategies. Uh, I absolutely endorse that. I would, yeah. yeah, I would add that um, we may have some information about uptake uh, of PrEP from dispensation, but over time we have learned that drug levels are critical and we have more strategies than ever, hair, plasma, dry blood spots, even uh, point of care urine tests uh, that can examine the extent of use of that PrEP uh, over time, it's proved to be an invaluable tool in our trials. But uh, Deb is bringing up the very important issue that we're leading into, which is that it's true, our trials are, are, are becoming large and they can't get much larger. And this, as we expand uh, both the demand for PrEP and the options for PrEP we are going to see that we're probably going to need to have additional strategies for evaluating new PrEP products. So Eugene, let's let's turn to you on the PrEP VAC, uh, where a slightly different strategy is being taken after the registration, you're using PrEP as a kind of a, almost a bridging until presumably, I think the hypothesis is the immune, uh, you know, impact will be felt. So how is that transition happening? Just unpack that. How, how is the team imagining you're going to transition out of the active prep part um, into the second half of the trial? How is that happening in practice? Thank you, Linda Gill. Um, and I'm happy to join the panel to discuss this. So the prep work trial hasn't actually started. We had our site initiation for the first site uh, just last week. Um, however, the registration cohort uh, has been running since 2018. Um, and one of the things that we, we are, we've done in the registration cohort is to, to find out what people know about PrEP awareness, and then if people are willing to use it and uh, refer them to 
uh, community providers of PrEP. And um, what we have seen, uh, we have five sites. We have a site in Durban, we have two sites in, in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam and in there, and we have a site in Maputo and then in, in Masaka in Uganda. So we've seen uh, a variable picture of, of overall people having very low, low knowledge about PrEP at the beginning, uh, but expressing high willingness to actually take it. But where we've offered uh, referrals, uh, for instance, in Masaka, where we, we currently are uh, sending people to get PrEP for free, the uptake is still low, it's about 20%. Uh, so what we are doing is to map out these uh, providers. And the question you asked, uh, after the 26 weeks where the trial is actively providing PrEP, we are mapping out um, those referral networks and establishing connections and uh, relationships with these providers. And also educating the participants because we shall be recruiting from the registration code about the availability of, of these providers and trying out the referrals and seeing how they work and hopefully perfecting that uh, by the time the, the trial is running and we need to end this, we'll then uh, have proper systems of uh, linking people who still are interested in taking PrEP from the trial to the community providers. So there's there's a couple of questions here. The one is, and, and maybe this is easily answered, what, what can we do when an exposed uh, participant, I guess, um, you know, or somebody who is regularly, and I guess by definition in these phase threes, people are being exposed to HIV, um, that they refuse to take PrEP. And maybe, Eugene, that's directed more at you because, you know, by and large, in the other trials, um, you know, the, 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 either the PrEP is part of the eligibility, the part of the trial itself, or it's a choice anyway. So um, what, what are you doing if, if somebody's in PrEP VAC but isn't wanting to take PrEP? So what we are doing is actually uh, an offer of PrEP. Um, and if someone is not interested in taking PrEP or says they can't take PrEP, we shall still... Uh, have them in the trial, but uh, then, uh, not require them to take PrEP if they are not willing to take it. Uh, and we hope that this will be few, but we do not know uh, what is actually going to happen because in the registration cohort, the people we see not taking up referrals, one of the reasons they give is, at least in Uganda, PrEP is still being provided by HIV clinics. So there's this stigma, people not wanting to be seen in those clinics. And also others say, we do not have it uh, in my residence, in, where, in my community where I live. So it's a bit difficult to, to, not to, to travel and get it where it is actually provided. So I'm hoping that in the trial itself, fewer people will refuse to take PrEP. But uh, in general, yes, we don't require that everyone takes PrEP before they are enrolled. So I'm going to pose this question to all of you and just hear your thoughts about this. Dave asked, you know, sort of very clearly said in, in his talk that finding registration cohorts might become very, very difficult. We're about to have Cabotegrava, you know, available more broadly. Um, who knows what the monoclonal antibody AMP study is going to teach us around the potential of the cocktails coming down the pike. So, I mean, do you guys think for how much longer are we going to be able to have the concept of a registration cohort? Is this something that we're going to have to put to bed or do you honestly, you know, think this is, we're still going to find those cohorts around the world. And I'd love to hear from each one of you. So, you know, feel free uh, to jump in. Uh, we'll, I can, we can start in my top right. Jorge, what are your thoughts? Actually, yes, I think so. Uh, uh, the, um, right now, the, not all the countries in South America have an extensive PrEP program. Brazil is the only one that actually the government is taking care of this. Although there are other countries that are moving along like Argentina or Peru that actually are going to include uh, Truvada as, 
as in their programmatic uh, campaigns, uh, uh, there, there is a still um, a lot of people that do not have access. So registration of cohorts could be done. And if even if we have a, a good coverage, of, a coverage increasing of PrEP, we can still uh, do the registration of cohorts. Actually, it's interesting. This I don't. I, I would. I, I don't think this is a statistical question. I think this is really a almost more a community question. Like the idea that you have a trial that's coming up and that you register people for that trial and in the period where they're waiting for the trial to begin, you're measuring HIV incidence. That's kind of the idea of a registrational cohort. Um, and I, I would be interested to know whether, it to, to me it's a question more to the community is in this time and waiting, um, what, um, what are the prevention tools that we would be that the community would expect to have in that time of waiting. Exactly, well put. I don't know if anyone wants to speak out about that. Post. What, what are we hearing from the ground? Stefan, what, what did you hear it, during those conversations? Uh, you know, is that a rapidly moving uh, sort of dialogue or, or, or do you think this is still gonna be a possibility in the future, just how we, how we perhaps, you know, as you say, operationalize it <clears throat> yeah i think um similar to deborah's comment <laughs> um i think the other thing that came up in conversation is that this is this is obviously going to look different based on the region in which the study is happening um so i think that's a really important consideration and i think one of the other things that's important to consider is how you might be able to collect additional information during the registration process that could inform future designs or future products um, and so obviously we're going to look at the registration cohort um, in the context of folks who are not interested in, in current available uh, PrEP modalities. And are there other ways in which PrEP could be administered that could be captured in this process? I just, I feel like there's an opportunity here anytime people tell you they're not interested in what's available, that you can get some more information about what they might want as opposed to just sort of moving things along. I love yeah. that thought because we heard Eugene say that um, having PrEP provided in HIV clinics was a barrier for some people. And that's, that's I imagine we could even go a, a layer deeper in understanding uh, people's wants and desires about, about PrEP and barriers. Yeah, so maybe I'll ask Eugene to just, you know, expand on that a little bit. Do you think you know, you guys are coming to the point now, as you say, where you're launching the interventions on prep back. Do you think there was a time interval? Could you have done this study if you designed it today and you were just starting your registration? Is that, you know, was there a time element that's kind of miss, missed? Or, or do you think it's the same today as it was a couple of years ago when you were getting the registration cohorts going? Now, so my sense is that um, it's getting harder to to actually um, as get people who we want to put in a registration cohort like this. And I think one of the reasons actually for doing this was to help really identify sort of in real time if if you're getting the right people and change strategy where need be. Uh, the right people in terms of uh, they have high enough incidence for you to actually take them into a trial. And we've had the opportunity to actually see that at, at some of the sites. Uh, in terms of it's, whether it's, it would have been uh, the same uh, now, like it was in 2018, I certainly don't think so. I think um, it might actually have been much easier to do this many years ago and as uh, prevention methods become more and more available. It becomes a little bit more difficult to actually identify the, the high-risk populations, yeah. Dave, on the note of these registration, the run-in approach, and I'm glad someone else has asked this question because it cropped up into my mind. I'm just gonna ask it, maybe it, there's a simple answer to it, or, or maybe it's just a duh, yes, of course. Um, you know, clearly in the registration, you take out the highest risk individuals uh, because they seroconvert and remove themselves. So do you 
therefore overestimate, and this might apply in recency type testing as well, you overestimate your incidence um, in, in the future actual trial because you've removed the highest risk individuals, right? How much of a problem is that if that is the case? Certainly, theoretically, that is a problem. We are looking at a group of people and those who seroconvert then do not enter the trial. So we have a seroconversion rate that mm -hmm. applies to it before. It gets to, I think, a deep question about the populations we enroll and the nature of their relationship of risk to HIV, whether or not uh, risk, there's the strat of risk and we're depleting those who are having contact with HIV early on in the trial. I can say that my experience with that, and again, I'd love to hear Deb comment on this, is that that's not so much the case. So Linda Gale, we worked on IPREX, the placebo incidence over about a year and a half was 3.9 per 100 person years. When people returned for the open label extension, which was around, unfortunately, a year, the uh, incidence during that gap was 3.8 per 100 person years. So we saw many, over 100 seroconversions during IPREX, 79 during that gap. It's not a sense that um, risk is so easily uh, depleted. Yeah, I, I, I would concur. I mean, I think that is your initial thought, um, but then I've always been struck at how we get, we see infections throughout the life of a trial. Um, you know, that does seem to be, and I guess it follows, you know, we say this all the time, people's lives change um, and their circumstances change and, and patently, HIV risk uh, also follows the, you know, no, no specific patterns. I'd agree with that. Um, Deb, we haven't spoken much about the counterfactual uh, sort of concept. In terms of the kinds of design options in this session, what we've heard about in this session, where does it sit in the sort of ranking order of best options? Where, where would you put it in terms of favorite or less favorite? That's a really, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I would summarize for us in the presentations that we saw, we saw about three different approaches to counterfactuals, right? So there was the counterfactual that Rafi talked about, which is using historical data about um, reductions in HIV that had previously been seen based on the use of Truvada. And, you know, we can kind of estimate what the placebo might have been. We saw what I presented, which was um, placebo data from another trial that has, you know, good overlap with the population that you're, um, you know, so, so that's kind of like direct incidence data from some, a group of people that are kind of similar at the same time. And we saw Dave's and um, the PrepVac idea of using this registrational trial, so data collected prior to the trial starting, and then um, Dave talked a little bit about a similar idea using a completely different approach, which is the, um, the cross-sectional incidence assay. So a lab-based method for doing a, a registrational cohort type idea. So that, that's like four different ideas for counterfactuals. And um, I, I think I also did mention that this counterfactual idea um, is something the regulators are open to. So that they can, they are, they are cognizant of the issue that we're having and that we're potentially facing. And they seem to be thinking that this counterfactual idea is, you know, really could have legs. Um, no one's done it yet. Um, we have, I'd say in the next year, we, we're gonna have some exciting data where we can actually do this. So the 083 trial doesn't need a counterfactual, but we can still go through the exercise and we will do that. Um, so I think we're gonna get some sort of they won't be real test cases, but they're like um, trial runs, let's say, <laughs> trial runs where we don't actually need it. Um, I think um, some of the challenges that will happen as we go on is that true placebo data, um, we've been in an a time in the last year or, year or three where we've had this peculiar circumstance of placebo randomized trials um, proceeding at the same time as active control trials, these non-inferiority trials. And 
Um, I don't think that's likely to continue. So I think our true placebo data will get dated. And I think as that, that, that information gets dated, it also becomes harder for it to become relevant to current placebo, you know, to current HIV incidence rates. So I think whereas the cross-sectional incidence assay may remain more relevant depending on what happens with the standard of prevention. So I, I think there are a lot of, so the challenging statistical issues is like, what do we do about increasing standard of prevention in the community, which is gonna change incidence rates? <clears throat> what do we do about aging placebo data? Like how can we make that relevant to the trials we're actually conducting? But um, I'd say the last point I would make is um, at least for pre-exposure prophylaxis, we, we have pretty convincing evidence that the prevention potential of these um, drugs is extremely high. And it's not so difficult to get relatively convincing evidence for a 80 or 90% reduction. Um, it would be much more problematic if we were looking at um, efficacy that was more in the 30 to 40% range. And I think these counterfactuals would have more problems. So, sorry for taking so long, but that's, it was a thank hard you. thing. Yeah, but I think, uh, thank you for the clarification. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Rafi, just in terms of the 083 and um, 084 studies, how, how hard, just to get to, you know, that design, how much did it undermine what, you know, was in the spirit of Cabotegrava once every two months shot? Um, and how hard was it to do that study um, in, you, in your opinion? Um, thanks, Linda Gale. I, you know, I, I do think that enrolling a population that was representative of the groups who haven't benefited um, in the same way that um, that we've seen population level instance reductions documented um, in major cities and initiatives across the world that have sort of celebrated daily oral prep, those disproportionately affected by HIV really required um, an incredible amount of effort on the part of the community engagement team at HPTN and the 083 team. And I think without that groundwork um, and those partnerships, that level of engagement by half of the US population enrolled being black or African-American, 12% transgender women, um, two thirds under the age of 30, so representing the younger populations challenged by adherence, never would have been even on the table. And I, and I hope that gives uh, gives voice to um, the notion that 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 sort of um, uh, in representation in these clinical trials is not only possible but critical to the success of the trials in terms of not only the results being generalizable um, but encouraging people to see these products as something that they could um, leverage for themselves. Um, and I think 084 has done similar community engagement to make sure young girls um, and, uh, and, and adolescents are represented in, in their work also. I think obviously that trial is ongoing, so we don't know the, the, full, the full landscape of what they've accomplished. But um, I did want to make that one point. I think you remind us again that obviously these trials are just so important because they, they are a beacon to what will follow in terms of the operationalization of, uh, after all, that's why, why we do it. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that we're developing products for people to use um, at the end of the day. And so I think there's a, an amazing amount to be learned uh, from the clinical trials uh, and we have done to date. So we're, 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 we're moving into the home stretch uh, this afternoon. We hope everyone's really enjoyed uh, this first of our sessions, but I'm going to end by going around the group um, and maybe asking you that this was entitled Lessons Learned, what we've learned so far from the clinical trials that are in the field, um, and perhaps what how that can inform our designs in the future. And I'm going to ask each one of you what your sort of main lesson learned uh, is uh, or takeaway, and I'm sure there are many, so I'll ask you to choose one that stands out for you today. 
uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what we've gained to date and, and how we can use that fact to take us forward. Um, and, and I'm going to start on this side this time and start with you, Deborah, um, perhaps to just launch us there. You know, I'm going to speak really from the perspective of 083. And I think the main lesson I learned is that we really did have this idea that um, oral pills was a barrier to successful use of prevention. And I think, you know, staying with the original design we had and staying with that conviction, convic conviction that offering a different modality could really help in prevention um, was was a something that was good to have a conviction to just stay with the original design and and um, see it through, and I, that was yeah. a good lesson for me. Great, thank you, Rafi. Can you add to that? Yeah, yeah. I'll echo what what Deborah said and expand a little more. I think you know during the blinded phase of 083, we had a we were we hand wrung tremendously as the trial went on. We did have some indication that the overall um, pooled incidence across the trial was lower than expected. Our SMC and DSMB advised us of that a year before um, the trial stopped. And we really had a tremendous amount of anxiety about our initial assumptions of the trial, about um, what the activity of the agents would be, what the adherence would be, what the design should be. And as Deborah said, really sticking to your beliefs about the science, understanding that um, incidence is dynamic, PrEP use is changing. Um, the ways people are taking up PrEP are changing, but, um, but uh, to stick to the scientific convictions, you never know in a blinded study what's happening, and that's why you do the rigorous science in, an in, a, in a blinded way to be unbiased. Thank you. And maybe that's also, you know, important for us, uh, for the trials that are underway at the moment. I know COVID has caused incredible tumult, um, of course. Eugene, what are your lessons uh, or take-homes? So like I said, we are just about to start the study, but what I've learned so far is we've had interactions with uh, our CABs, our participants over the last two years. And one of the worries that we had was how people would understand this trial and the design and so on. And um, I think, what we have learned in this period is that people actually understand and uh, ask you questions that make you make you understand that they actually know what you're talking about. So, for instance, one of the questions that we received from our CAB was, "How are you going to evaluate uh, this? Is how how will you know whether it's the vaccine or the prep that works?" all that has worked. And that's the question that we didn't really expect. You would expect from someone who has really understood. So uh, I think this is encouraging that people are engaged and um, are supporting this and community to really do these trials, even if they're becoming more and more complex. Thank you. David. I think what is striking me is not 10 years ago that our oral prep came out, it looked like a niche intervention. There was not much demand for PrEP. We've seen that demand is highly dynamic. It's We haven't capped out yet in a demand for oral PrEP. People who may not have initially wanted it may desire it later. So I think as we think about uh, our interventions and especially for background interventions, we may see that demand may increase uh, for uh, established interventions. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Yes, I, I can say that uh, for the last two decades, we have been enrolled in several prevention trials, and we have enrolled thousands of people. What tell us that uh, we have a really, really good engagement of the, with the community. We have worked for years with the community and understand what are their needs. So, and this, over the years, they continue to support us. They understand that uh, we are working to find new strategies for their, for them, and they are supporting us. So I think it's, uh, it's, this is key. If we work with the community, we will get these results, and we'll continue to get these results. So as far we continue to do it. So 
Thanks, Jorge. Science is community, right? So I'm going to end uh, with the last word to Stefan and just apologize again for leaving you off the list. And thank you, Stefan, for your, for your role and help here. So last word to you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, I appreciate communities and science. Um, I, I think this work of Mosaico is confirmation that we, as a field, the, the collective, we need to abandon the term hard to reach. Um, and we really need to work on building the relationships and engaging communities as partners in the process. It can be done, it's been done. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about community involvement in the trial design process and the considerations thereof in the future panels uh, associated with this series. Well, thank you to an amazing uh, lineup of panelists and, and wonderful talks uh, before that. So I hope your appetite has been thoroughly whetted uh, for the future. And so I invite you to come back on the 6th of November uh, when we'll focus on those future trial designs. So very exciting. Um, again, thank you to everybody for participating this afternoon for great questions and to the panel at large. And I'll hand over now to Roger again. Thank you very much, Linda Gale. Um, I'd like to thank the organization who are partner in the, organi in the organization of this series of webinar, the HBTN, the HPTN and the uh, Forum for Collaborative Research. Uh, I'd like to stress and, and and signpost that the forum is also organizing a series of events on the counterfactual approach and that our colleague at AVAC are also having an academy on trial design and we're all working together to uh, disseminate this information make it accessible to a, a large audience uh, and I would like to also thank the organizing committee uh, with whom this was uh, would have not been possible we spent many 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 hours at late at night or early in the morning and um, as uh, Linda Gale said, uh, there will be two other, uh, well, at least two other panel uh, on the 6th and uh, 18th of November, which will look more specifically at future trial design. A new series, a new set of presentation will be made available this week, probably on Wednesday and Thursday. You will all be kept informed. Uh, and this, uh, this new presentation will support the future panel discussion. Um, we will make this recording edited available as soon as possible. We hope we have answered your question online and uh, try to, to, do, to do our best and we'll get back uh, on, on, on this to you if, if we can. Uh, I'm going to end here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, the panelists. Thanks, the chair. And thanks, the participants to uh, the webinar. Thank you very much and see you at the next panel. Thank you.